someone calling himself the simple skeptic has joined us in the chat. Welcome, 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 dear skeptic. And for those who haven't watched his latest contribution, let's see what he said about one of the very early videos. Um, buckle up, because you might fall out of your chair when you find out exactly where he goes. One of the oldest creationist arguments in a book, one that's been debunked a thousand times or more, and he goes there. The first and most basic disproof is the fact that it contradicts the most fundamental law in science. Stand by. Here we go. The second law of thermodynamics. Yeah, he went there. Something that's been debunked no end of times, and he should know it. In fact, he probably does know it. But like most creationists, he's disingenuous, and he's willing to lie for Jesus. Well, I think most of us have heard this story many times. As we've seen before, the second law states that disorder, with the fancy name entropy, increases but never decreases. Now, that's like all natural laws. It's true for things which just happen in nature. An intelligent being can interfere and create order, like arranging beads on a string to make a pattern. But beads don't make such a pattern all by themselves. The simplest living organism is packed full of astoundingly complex information. That information is coded in patterns of molecules along strings of DNA. And all that information is essential for that organism to work properly. And only intelligence can produce information. So the second law of thermodynamics wipes the theory of evolution off the face of the earth. But of course, that is too much for atheists to swallow. Because the whole worldview is based on evolution, which specifically denies any input from intelligence. So long ago, evolutionists jumped on the statement that the second law of thermodynamics was usually stated in terms of closed systems, a system where nothing comes in or out, for which the proof is simple. They started to claim it's only valid for a closed system, but it can be proved for an open system as well. But they stick their fingers in their ears and shout and scream and perform and tell us that it's only true for closed systems, and the Earth is not a closed system. Sunlight streams in, onto the earth, and its energy can do all the work needed to build life, from the rocks and the dust and the mud. But among these evolutionist shouters and screamers was a very famous man called George Gaylord Simpson. Years ago, he wrote a biology textbook in which he said, But the simple expenditure of energy is not sufficient to develop and maintain order. A bull in a china shop performs work, but he neither creates nor maintains organization. The work needed is particular work. It must follow specifications. It requires information on how to proceed. So there are two good reasons for rejecting the evolutionists who carry on chanting their mantra. Firstly, even if it did only apply to closed systems, it would not solve the problem Simpson raised. And secondly, it is valid for both closed and open systems, and it's just easier to prove for closed systems. Well, there are quite a few evolutionists who do realise, and they're quite embarrassed by well-meaning but ill-informed evolutionists who keep chanting their mantra. A very famous one was called Ilya Prigozhin. He did lots of work in theoretical thermodynamics. He was looking for refutations of the second law. He knew that the second law destroys evolution and he knew the mantra about open systems was not true. 
So for years, he tried to prove that it failed for systems kept far from equilibrium. It appeared for a while as if his work might prove that the second law did not hold for systems kept far from equilibrium. But it turned out that the energy and the intellectual input to keep the system far from equilibrium swamped the decrease in entropy he so desperately wanted. As Dr. John Ross noted, there are no known violations of the second law of thermodynamics. Ordinarily, the second law is stated for isolated systems, but the second law applies equally well to open systems. There is somehow associated with the field of far from equilibrium phenomena the notion that the second law of thermodynamics fails for such systems. It is important to make sure that this error does not perpetuate itself. And there's a good reason for this. People like Ross are embarrassed by evolutionists advertising themselves as scientists loudly trumpeting their ignorance of the thermodynamics in public. Let's repeat what he said just to make sure that all heard it. There are no known violations of the second law of thermodynamics. A few years ago, I gave a lecture at Stellenbosch University. In the middle of the lecture, a member of the biology department stood up and claimed I was speaking nonsense about evolution and the second law. He was every bit as confident and assertive as our visiting sceptic. One of his colleagues behind him stood up, tapped him on the shoulder and said, Quoas, I'm a chemist. I work with the second law all day long. He's right. You're wrong. Shut up. The scientist who first put forward the second law was one of the most respected scientists in history, Lord Kelvin. He very soon pointed out that it wiped out the story of evolution. Kelvin spent his life studying and applying science at the cutting edge of several fields. He came to the conclusion, if you study science deep enough and long enough, it will force you to believe in God. He also said, The more thoroughly I conduct scientific research, the more I believe that science excludes atheism. And I think that's why modern secular science has had to denigrate, cancel and abandon the scientific method. The scientific method is based squarely on observation and measurement. Einstein said, what can be measured is science. Everything else is speculation. Mendeleev said, science begins with measurement. Evolution is a story about slow change from inanimate matter to simple life forms and from simple to complex life forms over vast ages of time. Nothing about this has ever been measured. There has only been speculation. Kelvin said, I often say that when you can measure what you're speaking about and express it in numbers, you know something about it. But when you cannot measure it, when you cannot express it in numbers, your knowledge is of a meagre and unsatisfactory kind. It may be the beginning of knowledge, but you've scarcely in your thoughts advanced to the stage of science, whatever the matter may be. The scientific method requires that the scientific hypothesis must be based on the patterns observed in accurate observations and measurements. The scientific method also requires that if a theory or a hypothesis is disproved, it must be rejected and another one sought. 
But creation without a creator is so absolutely essential to the atheists of the secular scientific establishment that no matter how soundly disproved evolution, Lyellian geology, Big Bang-type cosmology, or anything else that their atheism stands on cannot be rejected. Their entire worldview crucially depends on them. As Thomas Kuhn pointed out, once it has achieved the status of paradigm, a scientific theory is declared invalid only if an alternative candidate, one acceptable to the establishment of course, is available to take its place. And that is strictly enforced. When Fred Hoyle had studied science deeply enough and long enough and had made a few poor decisions along the way, like Kelvin and other scientists, Hoyle also realised that creation was not explainable without a creator. He was belittled, ostracised and cancelled because he would not keep quiet about the truth. He would not kowtow to the paradigm. He'd come close to where Kelvin had come to when he said, The more thoroughly I conduct scientific research, the more I believe that science excludes atheism. And beyond that, he said, do not be afraid of being free thinkers. If you think strongly enough, you will be forced by science to the belief in God which is the foundation of all religion. You will find science not antagonistic, but helpful to religion. O oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth! When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him? and the Son of Man, that thou visitest him. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. Thank you for joining me for this episode. If you enjoyed it, please like, subscribe and press the bell so that you'll be notified as I release new movies. If you'd like to support this project, you're welcome to do so through Patreon. Find a link on my channel banner and in the description below.